Hi everybody, how you doing? This, uh, my name is Daniel Alter, and I'm uh, here to show you some techniques of how to properly stand and glaze to get the, the best aesthetic results. Um, regardless of the product that you use, um, whether it's GC, Emacs, or the Zerlux, uh, all are wonderful products. It's more the technique and the, the ability to play with contrast um, that provides you with the, the best results because we can achieve through stand and glaze a monolithic um, appearance of a layered crown and that's exactly what I'm going to be showing you today. All right so among some of the things here you can see um, what I've done is you, it, this is the same actually zirconia not only restoration but also uh, milled out of the, uh, the the same STL file as well as the same puck uh, but having the ability of adding stains um, in such a way that really provides a, a control of both chroma uh, where you want saturation in certain areas or you want it diluted in other areas as well as value. Um, so these stains provide you the ability of doing so and anterior staining is a little bit different than what posterior stains because you have different surfaces. Um, with that said, the way of treating the surfaces is different as well. Uh, a lot of the times you can, um, in the green state, really affect the way the final stage will, um, uh, will look like. Um, so, whether you use here, I have samples of, again, the same restoration, um, the same design, both in the anterior as well as the posterior, as well as from the same um, zirconia puck. And you can see that the, the shade differences are significantly um, different. Uh, what I have here in this is, I've actually labeled, because I, what I did was I experimented and I wanted to see. Um, whether uh, the, the Zerlux FC2, uh, Emacs, or GC Initial, uh, the luster paste will give different results for different type of um, you know, restoration. So I have three in a bridge here, as well as the same anterior tooth, as well as two posterior teeth. And using this technique, um, all three came out a really, really viable, um, natural looking monolithic restoration that really appeared to be um, almost layered and very aesthetic. And the concept of it is being able to control or contrast different colors. Uh, it's no different than what artists use where they, if, if you look at a painting, and oftentimes a painting, you, you feel like you're looking 10 miles into the, the, into the image. Uh, and in reality, artists have significantly less space than we do. And what they do is they, they use different line angles as well as different contrasting stains, uh, or in their, their case, colors. So it's kind of the same concept where you get the depth, you get the vitality, you get the, the real, as the uh, lack of monolithic, but have that same result where it gives you the visual illusion as though it is, has more depth and more uh, layered of a look. So that's what we'll cover today. What I always do is I, I also use what's called a, a stump dye. Um, depending on whether you're doing a lithium disilicate or you're doing um, a translucent uh, zirconia, the underlying tooth structure is truly going to affect the way your final shade is going to come out. So here in this case, I have both for the um, molar, which is what I'm going to be demonstrating today, as well as for a central, which is the other that I'm going to demonstrate today. So the stump die, and you, you can see that once I place the stump die, it really, it, it just adds a little warmth to it. So for example, this may be an A35 with a uh, perhaps an A2 mill on top of it. And you can see that right away on the cervical, it, it's, it really warms up the restoration. And that's prior to putting anything on it. All it is is <clears throat> milled and then um, sintered. So now we're ready to go ahead and, and post process where we're gonna stand and glaze. So that's the one I'm gonna start with first. So I use these um, reverse grippers because it, it becomes very easy to be able to manipulate at that point. So I've prepared my, um, in this situation, in this demonstration, I'll be using the luster paste. So I've prepared my, my, um, my palette here and what I've done is the neutral, I have diluting liquid as well as neutral and some of my colors. For this, we'll be using the, uh, the LA in order to achieve a uh, similar to a, perhaps an A3 um, shade. So the first thing I'm going to do now, what I also do with the luster paste is I actually mix the neutral with the stains. And what that does is it gives you, the, again, the control of being able to glaze properly, uh, the consistency as well, because with luster paste and with these type of pastes, um, you don't necessarily have the consistency of what the 
analog uh, glaze used to be. It, it actually has to be rather thicker. So being able to, I find that mixing it with the actual stains allows me to have an easier time with controlling um, the, the uh, placing the glaze and stain on it. So what I always do is I start with a little bit of the neutral and just dilute it a little bit. Then I, I sparingly put it on the actual restoration. And what I do is I always go from either mesial to distal. I never go from gingival to incisal because then you can get some um, glaze or stains inside the crown, which is something that you absolutely want to avoid. So I go ahead and I just lightly, um, and again, it's a thicker consistency. And if you can see here, the consistency is rather thick. So I manage it where I can lay it on very thinly where I have an almost of a glazed already. Now, one thing that I like with these type of brushes, which are the, uh, the layer art, uh, they come in a three set, and especially this one, if you manipulate the, the neutral well enough, you can actually create surface texture on it, as I'm doing right now. So the imbrication lines are already there, and you can do that with the glaze. One thing that I also failed to mention also is that some of the, the valleys or the, um, the developmental lobes um, always have a little bit more of a uh, texture to it rather than the high spots. The high spots tend to be on the, the height of contour as well as the medial distal and on the, in the middle. Um, and that's caused naturally by the inner part or the lip of our mouths and over the years we actually high shine. So we want to be able to simulate that in the, the actual restoration as well. So in my pre-sintering in the green state, I actually I place that where I round those high spots and I create a little bit of texture, a little deeper in the, in the developmental uh, grooves uh, and less in the height of contour uh, as well as the mesial and distal. Because what that does is when light reflects on it, it actually bounces the light back and therefore giving it that high shine and giving it that vitality. So having done that in the pre-center stage, now we can go ahead and we can lightly um, put a thick enough neutral on it in order to be able to uh, attain it. Then I take the, um, a little bit of a thicker. So this one, so the, like I said, it comes in three brushes. Uh, the first one is a glaze brush, then this is a stain um, brush, and then finally the smaller of the two is what they call a color brush. And that allows me to, especially in the occlusion, to get into the finer fossas and the grooves and really make it look as natural as possible. So the next stage is again, I'm going to wet it and I'm going to, this is, has been already pre-mixed with neutral. So the only thing I'm trying to do right now is just add some chroma. So what I'm doing is an, on, on anteriors in any teeth, the, the buckle of the labial, as in this case the labial, is on the cervical and then it creeps up towards the interproximals. So don't just kind of put it throughout the, the, the cervical because that, that makes it look very artificial. So what, what I always do is I put a little bit of stain right on the cervical just to attain the chroma that I'm looking for. And then I use that exact stain to kind of blend it upwards as need be into the interproximals, specifically into interproximals. And, and this is even that much more important when it comes to um, when you're dealing with bridges because you really want to make them look as individual as possible. So I go ahead and I increase that chroma as need be into the interproximals as well as into the cingulum on the posterior, on the, uh, on the lingual rather. And on the lingual, what I do is I extend it a little bit further into, towards the incisal edge. Not into the incisal edge, but towards the incisal edge. Because on the lingual, typically we have, being that it's the, um, the area where there's a lot of biting forces, there's more dentin present there, and therefore it's a little bit darker or richer in chroma. So go ahead and depending on what I'm trying to achieve, which shade, I blend it into it. And so by the cervical, it's significantly more chromatic. And then as I go towards the incisal, it tends to tone down as such. Now that once I'm satisfied with the, the overall shade, which we can take a shade guide to. And we 
we can get fairly close to an A3. As you can see here. So now I can go ahead and I can add a little bit where I feel it, it needs to tone down. So I go ahead and I put on the cervical. Then in nature, as you can see, the, the height of contours are a little bit lighter. And right above the height of contour, which is this area, again, it's slightly more chromatic than at the height of contour because that's the more of a polished area. So, but you don't want to make it look like you're just adding it. You want to make it look like it's blended and it's been there forever. So then what I do is once I'm happy with my shade, I can now pay more attention to the incisal. And the incisal is where we're going to have that illusion as though it is a uh, more of a layered. So first thing I do, and again, depending on how translucent your zirconia or whether it's lithium disilicate, I go ahead and I start with the interproximals, placing a little bit of blue, both on the mesial and the distal, more so on the distal than on the mesial, and then just break it up slightly. Now what I find is the lighter the shade, the less blue you need to add. So once I've placed the blue, and again, what you want to achieve is not only the incisal, but also the distal up to the middle third, as well as the mesial, perhaps a little shorter. So once you layer a little bit of blue, you can also layer a little bit on the lingual to really give it that effect. And then on a, on a lighter shade, I use a contrasting of blue and white, where on a darker shade, I use the contrasting of gray and white. Um, again, that's more of a control of value, which I'll get into in a second. So then what I do is I take a little bit of white stains and very faintly, I just go ahead and I kind of cut in different angles. And, but the idea is to have a very thin, fine line. If, it, if it's very dominant, it, it's, it's going to look artificial and fake. You want it to be very faint, where it's very difficult to see. But what it does is it actually gives you the look of, of a layered or natural tooth. As such. I don't know if you so you can certainly see that. Okay, and one, once so in the incisal third we have a very layered look, and oftentimes I go ahead and I take that same chroma and I just slightly layer it right at the incisal edge on the lingual side. And what that does is it gives that warmth from within um, and really has that layered look of very vitality to it. Um, and then of course you would match it to the shade guide uh, to make sure that it has the right value as well as the right chroma. Um, it may very well be, you know, typically um, rarely do I get just a, a straight A3. Uh, there's always some kind of custom uh, staining uh, that I do. So I can control the amount of chroma as well as the amount of value. Um, both here as well as, you know, depending on, then if I, I want to go ahead and I want to put a little bit of brown stain, which I can, but again, make sure that that's what your doctor is really looking for, your clinician and a patient, and I put that in the pits to really pop it out and make it look as natural as possible. Now remember, the lingual fossa is more chromatic than it is on the labial, so you want to be able to deliver that as well. And it really gives a very natural look to it. Then I would go ahead and I would fire it one time and I would check to see whether or not the, the, the shade that I'm trying to attain has been met. If not, you may have to do a secondary bake. However, if the shade is there and you're just looking for a higher luster, um, then I, I always go to hand polishing. So hand polishing is one of two different ways that I do, and again, depending on what you're trying to achieve. I find that uh, the patient's age has a direct correlation to how high shine or lack of high shine you have. Just keep in mind that if you're, you're having a restoration that is very glazed, uh, once it interacts with saliva in the oral environment, it's going to look that much more glazed. So you want to have, you certainly want to have a glaze, but you don't want it to have a very high shine 
when you have a medium glaze and hand polished in certain areas with conjunction of the um, saliva, it really makes it look like a very natural and viable tooth. So what I do is, depending again on the restoration, I either use something that's called a Zircon Bright, which is a paste. Now, as I said earlier, I only high shine the high spots. I leave the low spots alone because I want them to have texture. I want them to have, because the way the light penetrates and or bounces back off of it, really makes a difference where you have contours in certain areas or, or texture in certain areas and then or have um, a very glassy surface because the light bounces back to it. So you want to strategically place those areas in the height of contours as well as the line angles um, because that's the information that we're receiving back in the eye. So I either use this or any of the, the fine um, diamond impregnated rubber wheels. Again, just high shining those areas. So that's for the anterior. For the posterior, I follow a similar steps. However, now we have the occlusion or the occlusal, the occlusal table um, that requires a little bit more of different attention um, to really make it look very natural. So I'll go ahead and I'll demonstrate how I stain that as well. So again, I start off with a thin layer or thin coat rather of the neutral, which is similar to the glaze. That's why I like the reverse grips. It's, it makes it very easy to control and be able to manipulate and move it around. So as you can see, from the beginning of this, it's just a, a zirconia milled restoration monolithic. It has one color, but now it's up to us as dental technicians to bring it to life, to really add that value and that, um, that stain to it to make it look as viable and, and lifelike as possible. So similarly, I start off with my stain that's mixed with neutral, and I start off at the cervical, cervical third, and I bring it into the interproximals. Interproximals tend to be a little bit heavier or more chromatic and a little bit more towards the, um, more towards the incisal. If you get a little too much, you just want to feather it in, really blend it well. And the interproximals again. And you can see, that's why I love this, this uh, particular stain tray because it's very easy to achieve. And I also have, in, in, I wrote down which stain is correlated or um, with which type of shade. So it's an easy go-to that I can quickly and easily flip to. And then I have exact orientation of which stain goes into it. So I place my gingival stains, my chromatic, and I start blending it lightly towards the incisal edge or towards the occlusal. Now once I do that, I also, being that now we have the occlusal table, I turn my attention to the occlusal and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same stain, but now I'm going to put it into the central fossa and kind of blend it towards the cusps and tips. And what that does is it gives it the depth that we're really looking for and it gives it the multi-layered feel and look to it. So I use the same chroma. You want to be careful not to put too much in there because if it's not very faint and very um, uh, strategically placed, it kind of looks like you stained it and then that's not the, the outcome that we're looking for. You want it to look as though it's, it, it was built from within. So very faint, very blend into the actual zirconia, into the actual enamel is where you get the best results. So now that I've done my chroma, I can now go ahead and add that blue again to get that translucency. So here you have a little bit of a different dynamic than what we have on the anterior because now you have multiple areas. So again, I put on the mesial as well as the distal and slightly at each other end of the cusps. You don't want to go into in between the two cusps because then that's going to make it look, again, very artificial. You don't forget about the lingual. So you put a little bit of blue and you go ahead and you... Now, the, um, the, the marginal ridges interproximally are typically very translucent in natural teeth. So you want to be able to put that on the mesial as well as on the distal with the spillway 
to make sure that you incorporate those. What we're doing is we're just adding a little bit more of the translucency and vitality to this. Then we're going to go back to a similar technique, what we've done in the anterior, but now what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of white to break up or contrast that blue, which will give it, again, that feel of it being as though it's layered. So again, little tiny striations. It should be faint enough to be visible, but not too faint, not too strong that it's going to overtake the actual shade. So you're just kind of almost in the background, but it gives the eye a feeling as though it's multiple areas or multiple layers rather. And you want to break up that blue uh, as well as the zirconia. And don't forget to also place it on the posterior. I mean, on the lingual. Now, with posterior teeth, what I find is when you place a little bit of white right at the cusp tips, as well as the marginal ridge, it really makes that occlusion table really pop out. And in nature, if you look at it, that's where oftentimes there is a lot of um, slight calcifications right at the, at, the, uh, right at the cusp tips. So what I do is I emulate the same. And as you see here, it kind of really pops out. It makes it look a, like a really nice restoration. So quickly and easily, within five minutes, you can really achieve some fantastic outcomes, as you'll see here in a second. And you don't want to go too crazy. And again, um, with the striations, um, what it does is gives vitality. Uh, but you also want to know your clinician and how much they, they, they want. Um, certainly, just slight like that would certainly be good for uh, an A3. Then finally, I take my very fine brush, and this is where I put the brown stain. But the brown stain, I literally put only on the f in, in the central fissures. So what that does is it gives us the feel or the illusion of depth. And in nature, you find that the same as well as separating, I typically like to separate the lingual cusps, the mesial from the distal, and it really looks like a very natural tooth. So, okay. So that's on the posterior, and again, what I would do is I would go ahead and fire it, check to see how much, if any, color correction is necessary, um, and then be able to hand polish. Now what I do is oftentimes, especially with these monolithic uh, restorations, as I'm trying to achieve, um, after that first firing, there may be a situation where you're, you know, the chroma might be too intense or the chroma may not be intense enough. The value may be too high or vice versa. So as dental technicians, as knowledgeable and seasoned and experienced dental technicians, we know how to manipulate that. However, I find that having something as inexpensive from an art store, it's just a couple of dollars, um, a color wheel really helps not only myself, oftentimes after a very long day, uh, but also the technicians that are within a laboratory because if they're trying to achieve, if it's too orange, too brown, too green, and to tone it down or vice versa, it's a very easy, because you have the secondary and the primary, and you can actually mix and match. Um, so you can say, okay, as we know, in, in order to reduce the chroma, you want to add the complements of that, um, that color, that hue, rather. If you want to increase the chroma, you add the same um, hue. Um, and also the, the secondary and so on. So you have the ability of seeing exactly from the primary to the secondary and the complements which ones you're going to add to. On the flip side of this, it addresses value. So if we're getting a shade from a doctor, we're doing a color match where doctor perhaps may want an A2 but with a high value. How do you achieve that? Um, it's actually very easy to achieve if you approach it where you start off with a lighter color and now you're adding the chroma. or doing the, quite the opposite. If you get an A2 with a lower value, which means that they want the chroma of an A2, but they want it to be duller or, or more gray or, or not as bright, um, you know that you need to add the complements. So for example, in A2, you would add the violet, as is shown here. Um, the violet will tone down the value. So that's where understanding the colors and understanding how to manipulate the colors will really give you the best results. Um, then where to place it, as I demonstrated just now, breaking up with contrast with the blue and the white um, on lighter shades. Uh, I find that in the A and the B shades and then in the C and the D shades, you want to use the gray and the white. But that really gives you the, the contrast that 
gives your eye the illusion as though you're looking deeper into it and that there's more layers in the process. Thank you everybody for, for joining us for this edition of um, Standing Glaze. Hope this helped and uh, um, the more educated, the better knowledge you have, the better we can attain it, the best results. So I hope this helped and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.